Hello and welcome to the fifth episode, or 004, if you count from zero, like we do, like server does, or it's uh, 0101. I was just waiting for you to see if you could get it there. (laughs) It's like, where are you going with that? Oh, it's by Roman numerals, it's it's episode V. My episode. That's true, see? Your episode. Yeah, so the background for today's um, recording and I'll just start it off, is uh, a One Day With Nature, which is a free video that you can find. It's like a chroma key background. But we thought we'd have something where things were sort of moving, but not distractingly so. So this is a One Day With Nature, a lake in Latvia, obviously in the summer, because there's a lot of uh, fly and mosquito sound effects. So there's a little bit of a background hiss, but that's on the video, not our microphones. So yeah, welcome. Indeed, welcome. Um, we've, we've been very organised. Yeah, uh, we've been that's doing very well. Pretty organised. I mean, I've yeah. even resized the video so that you can't see the bit of YouTube that it's using. There you go. Yeah. That's clever. And so, it's uh, and we're using OBS for the first time. So the, yeah. the voice streaming is Discord, going into the desktop audio and the audio input capture for OBS. Yeah. So if it's if it's different, that's why professionalism. Yes, hopefully, Let's... hopefully, it hopefully gets better and better and better. Yeah, it's ka- kaizen, the art of small yeah. improvements. Um, yes, first came up with by Toyota, and then rather stupidly turned into Lean, um, which was uh, a, a very silly program for certain industries. Um, they tried to tried to bring what Toyota had done in minimizing all the wastage on a production line to all sorts of businesses like telephone call centers which is completely pointless because yeah, you can't that... you can't limit the time you spend on the phone with a with an end user or a customer you know you can't be more efficient if you're in a tele- telephone call center because it's an inefficient way of communicating anyway it's it's usually an yeah you have to solve the problem some people are going to have no, uh, no yeah some people are going to have no problem at all and some people are, you know, and they, and you're going to have a 30 second phone call and you're going to solve the problem. And somebody else is going to talk for two hours or it might take two hours to get all the information out of them that you need in order hmm. to solve their problem. So because you can't predict it, it's not a production line. So you can't use Kaizen as a way of fixing it. Same as a restaurant. You can't use Kaizen where people are involved, really. If people are the variable, you can't use that. You can only do it with machines. You can only make machines a little bit more efficient. Or you can only make the processes that the people do more efficient in conjunction with machines. Mm. But that's how people basically do it. Mm. I mean, this 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 kind of woolly yeah, thinking... It works on a production line. It doesn't, it doesn't. <clears throat> this kind of woolly thinking is what leads to employee dissatisfaction and leads to many, many layers of manager management. You know, like if you yeah. if you've got like several middle managers that are managing people with the idea of lean in mind, and are constantly trying to make everybody more efficient, in an industry where you can't be any more efficient because the person doing the job is a is a human, and the person doing the person being the problem is another human. And some people are going to be able to communicate properly, and some people aren't. So you can't you you can't make it a numerical fix. Mm. What you can do is you can fire the lean manager and then you save a whole salary every year because the lean manager is never going to do it. I mean, it's this kind of willy thing that's also that, that, leads, that leads to shit like Ayn Rand and the Rand Corporation and think tanks and stuff like that. It's what what was that guy's name? The guy that wrote Bullshit Jobs? Uh, uh, Dave. Dave. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah, he's an economist. Dave Graeber. Graeber hmm. or Graeber. Hmm. David Graeber. Yeah. G R A E. G R E. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, bum. Yeah, you need you need you basically need to read his book about bullshit jobs. And then if you work yeah. in any kind of an office, you'll see loads of bullshit jobs including manager. Most middle management is is worthless. You be you'd be better off appointing one of the people that actually does the job to have some time off to in order to organize people's holidays because that's generally all a manager does. You could write a piece of Wouldn't software. We all for better holidays. That's that's about all they do. They're the person. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. I'm, 
I'm pretty sure you could work out a paper AI that would work out your holiday roster better than a middle manager would. Yeah, I mean, you could probably. I'm pretty sure that you probably find paper AI does better. Yeah, you could probably find a piece of software that you'd say, "I want this day off," and it the the program would go away and look at the logged holiday or the requested holiday of everybody in your team, and figure out whether it's viable or not. Yeah. And then say, right, you can have this holiday, but you'd need to negotiate with the other person whose holiday clashes with yours. Hmm. And then the other person, if if you you know negotiate with them properly, might decide to relinquish their holiday, in which case you can then have it, or not, in which case you can't. You know, you really need to. I mean, if you you, I mean, you could just have the HR department phone you if you if you called in sick. You know, you could have a you could have a text messaging system where you text in "I am ill," and then HR might text you back saying, "Can we phone you? Because we just need to have a quick chat mm. and see when you're back in." And then and it's make done. sure everything's okay on the phone. And yeah, therefore, you don't not, you, yeah, you don't need that middle around. manager. Middle managers only exist so you can promote someone that is likely to screw over their fellow staff members. Have you got someone so devoted oh, to the company? That they'll, you're, they'll snitch you're, on the people. You're in debating their the value of capitalism in the modern world, there, yeah. D. Come on, come on. Anyway, let's get away from that, because that's, that's, that's a that's a that's one. Let's of move into positive circles. Yeah, let's let's. What can we do about this bullshit, V? Um, so, <laughs> in previous things, we've uh, we've been talking about um, the Church of Service stuff, and we did promise we'd get onto the two acronyms, um, Mars and Venus, as in actual sort of bits of um intellectual kung fu that you can use that will benefit you anyway you don't you don't need to be yeah. at all into church server to do the mars and venus stuff it just makes sense to me and it might make sense to someone else out there and if you've just tuned in if this is your random youtube video type of chat roulette church of server i, I think the term i want to use is meta religion mm. in that you can be of any faith or an atheist in order to join and that the level of faith is that not only do we believe that some form of higher intelligence is about to turn up, some are more likely than others, but, you know, we'd better look like really competent human beings when it does. And the reward of in and of itself is being a more competent human being. Yeah. Because you, if you're more you, competent, yeah. you've got more time to do more interesting stuff. And if you're a competent human being, you'll probably figure out what more interesting stuff you could be doing. Yes. I don't know. Does that make sense? That makes that makes sense to me. So it then we have been talking a lot about this. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if Hopefully there's, if there's only words. one or two members of the Church of Server, or there's a million. I mean, if there are a million members of Church of Server worldwide, we could leverage that money into just building our own retirement homes. We could just retire to a monastery, a, a, like a <laughs> Church of Server monastery, and just go, nope. We all put some money together. We realised that we didn't all want to go and join a monastery at exactly the same time, but we threw this money together. So there was a, there were there were options for monasteries in most countries. And yes, there are going to be some people that wouldn't necessarily benefit right away. But when you if you had like a hundred church of server monasteries all over the world that were all generating their own income revenue and they were all pretty much self sufficient. Yeah. That income stream yeah, think, could be I then leveraged that... to put one near you. You know, as a prospective member of the Church yeah. of Server. And all mm. you all you gotta do to join is be a, a competent non bigot. Yeah. That's it. So, you know. But I mean Work yeah, on that. Yeah, work on that. Be competent and non bigoted. Yeah. Well be free of fear, like the Buddha said. Yeah. Fear's one of the poisons that come into the Dharma. And then you turn that into understanding. Or, I don't know what, a lack of fear. Or courage. Because you can't be courageous about anything if you're not frightened of it. If it doesn't frighten... Picking up a spider yeah. that you're not frightened of and putting it outside is not an act of bravery. It is if you've got fucking arachnophobia. And yeah. you're like totally <laughs> shitting yourself as you slide the bit of card under the glass and you're going, oh, I don't want to touch it. That's 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 bravery. So you know, if you've got fear, then you you have the 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 potentiality of having bravery. If you're not frightened mm. of something, you can't be brave about it. Anyway, yeah. the Buddha, the three coins. What is it? Fear, anger, 
and uh, what was the other one? Oh, uh, no, you testing me. It's like, well, you've actually read this stuff. Yeah. <coughs> I know what I have. You expect me to retain it? I started doing other stuff after that. Yeah. That was like, that was like two months ago, and I had full of like one of these in my after that. Oh, you sparked interest in me there, though. Oh, the scenery's changed. Well, I like the sense to kill mosquitoes. Oh, see, this, this no. new, the new scenery is like a woodland looking down onto the lake in the distance. That's really nice. That's where I'd be sitting. There you go. We don't sit next to the lake, you idiot. That's where all the mozzies are. <laughs> you sit up above yeah, and look down on it. You look down on the lake going, the lake's brilliant. If I need any water to boil, I'll yeah. wander down there and then I'll wander quickly back so I don't get bitten to shit by mosquitoes. Back again. Yes. Anyway, um, so yeah, there, there's these three, Mars, three. What is it? Okay, so the Mars acronym stands for Make, Adapt, Repair, and Salvage, and it's more um, around the sort of physical Look stuff. Salvage. It's it's about stuff. I know. <laughs> so I I don't like buying new stuff because, you know, new stuff means that you're encouraging the capitalist system to make this variant of stuff. And make many more of them. But there's and there's there's loads of stuff lying around that you can you can make use of that will do the same stuff the same things as the tool. Hmm. I mean, this is more about tools or resources. So you can make it if you've got you know this is the handy thing about having a tool kit a toolbox. Um, now pretty much everybody that's that that watches Rangers Tube has got like a a, a huge collection of tools for making things. I don't. I don't know anybody in in the Rangers thing that doesn't have like quite a lot of tools. No, I can't think of anyone. Yeah. Um, so they're able. You know. I mean, if you're if you're just tuning into this randomly and you're thinking, what the hell are these guys talking about? There is a certain amount. I mean, I don't mean Willie Loman level of tool ownership. In Death of a Salesman, Willie Loman has every tool that can be imagined. And that collection of tools won't make you more competent or more happy or anything like that. It's just, you know, you just have a bunch of tools. But if, yeah. if you weigh the cost of, of buying something against the tools required to make it, not only then can you make more than one, but you also, even if you're making it for the first time, you get a certain amount of skill set from making it even badly yeah. the first time. Yeah, and then, and then you, get, and you, get, and you get satisfaction. You get purpose. You know that that, that labour is not wasted. Yeah, I mean, just FYI, you're probably the first one you make probably isn't going to be all that good. I mean, if any of you've seen the other videos where there's that desk that my um, my um, my DJ decks are on, I made that out of a bed frame. It cost mm. me it cost me about three quid to make it. You know, just because I already had a drill, I just needed a couple of drill bits and a few screws, and I literally took apart a wooden bed frame and built a desk out of it. Mm. It's, it's not a good desk. <laughs> it really isn't. But, it, it's, it's, but, it, but it's better than a broken bed frame. Yeah, it's better than spending. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could have probably spent money on buying a like a bookcase of about the right height. But yeah. I, I didn't want to spend. You know, I didn't want to spend like fifty to a hundred dollars on building something. Yeah. Uh, on buying something, because then basically you that's that's sort of just encouraging them to to make a thousand yeah. a thousand more. Whereas it, you, you a thousand know, more of the most boring and innate things ever that everyone has the same of, rather than making something that's useful. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think as an ethic, it, it, it sounds like, like when we've spoken about it before, I think it stands out to me as being a thing that talks about like being in somewhat post technology. So like maybe maybe using the using the skills of technology we have now, but going a step beyond and saying post technology meaning like you know things that happen after. Um, after mass industrialization has stopped functioning as a thing, but also things that are post scarcity. So using things as a recycle means or using things that are useful to make even more useful stuff. Yeah. So I mean, like a three D printer is a really good example. Trash, you know, if you, then then yeah, making you, it you know, is a good yeah. idea. I mean yeah. I didn't buy any. If you're large taking waste out of, out of the waste stream and you're and you're using some bolts to go and make a desk, hmm. then you really are using less resources to do, to do that thing and, and, and probably having a lot more fun doing it and probably having a lot more, you know, in your labor, you're enjoying your process a lot more. Oh, I don't know. Rather than just when I was going to the shop and buying one. Yeah, when I was trying to attach the legs to the DJ desk, that was a bit frustrating. Yeah, but that's just me at work every day. Yeah. 
so it was it was just like oh but i did learn an awful lot about what you can and can't make might make a desk with and i i yeah. just happened to have like a whole bunch of leftover shelf brackets in my toolbox so i used the shelf hmm. brackets as the connectors for the legs and stuff <coughs> it it does need an it does need to be repaired but there again i i also recycled another long length of wood that somebody else was throwing out and i've got hmm. that wood to hand for the structural support it's getting better Eventually, it will just be a big, yeah. big block of wood. It will just be solid scrap wood, so it can't fall over or lean over or anything like that. But it does, it is a bit wobbly still. But I now know how to make desk the the Mark II desk, and I've still yeah, I've still got the drill bits and the like shit like screws. You're making Mark One, you 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 make Mark Two, and it works even yeah. better. Yeah, you know, and then and then and then you and then you write the treaties on desk making. Hmm. You know. Um, well, you, yeah, there's I mean, more about this. In, there's more about this in. in I, I think there's more about this in in one of the Recky Media for this week. In one of the books I was going to suggest, which is where what? Um, where Stevenson talks about um, uh, Stevenson talks about um, the making of chairs. And there's this little bit in the in the first like third of this book in in Anathem, where where Stevenson is talking about through the character, he's talking about all these chairs that have been manufactured over the years by all of the monks. And the monks have made all these chairs, and some of them have had so much work and so much love put into them. They're just like works of art. And other ones have just been like hobbled together, and, and, and somewhere in between there are all these other chairs. But there's all of these chairs, and there's this beautiful little bit about the chairs in the um, And it's well worth having a listen or a read of. Um, yeah. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I got into that sort of thing from the idea of the platonic ideal. As Plato said mm. that they're, you know, so if you take a chair... There are, there are millions of chairs in the world, probably billions. I mean, most human beings own two or three. Um, but there is a central chairness about a chair. And when yeah. you identify what makes a chair a chair, then you can start building them. I've built quite a few chairs out in the woods. Because sitting on a log gets old quite quickly. And sitting on the floor yeah. means that you can't work on anything. It even... It's hard to whittle if you're actually sat yeah. on the ground, unless you're going to sit zazen. Or, you know, yeah. you know, it's aggravating and it hurts your back after a while. So eventually, mm. one of the things you do when you go wild camping is you set, tend to build a chair. Whether that's just letting your hammock down a little bit so it's at, like, knee height. So you've got a bit of a sofa mm. hanging between two trees. But it's really hard to do stuff. Also, if you get in your hammock after about four o'clock in the evening, you stay there. Because it's too sodding comfortable. You tend to, yeah. that's, that's your day over. The moment you sit in your hammock, that's it. You're not motivated to do anything. You're really. done. They're, they're very demotivational yeah. ways of lying around. But yeah, so you go for this platonic ideal of the thing that you're going to make. What does it do? You know, how how can I turn what I have into, into this thing? Or how can I turn what I have and add one or two more small things to make it do this? And everybody's adapted, to, you know, done that sort of thing. So making stuff is good. And making stuff out of junk is even better. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. I if I had the time, I'm I'm really tempted to make another table just out of the buckets that they throw away at work every day. Mm. They got these, you know, something like twenty liter buckets, you know, like the really big ones that if you went to be went yeah, to a hardware the, store, they cost you about. They're always mayonnaise buckets at my work. That's yeah. what they are. The square ones are always mayonnaise buckets. They always come with mayonnaise in them. We get we'll go through one or two a week and they go and they get used for the washing and they get used for this and they get used for that type thing. And I pull for lots of them because, you know, for an example of one, one of the things I'm going to use my, my 20 litre buckets for is two of them stacked inside one another with the outside painted. Um, you rough it up and give it a bit of a, a bit of a lick of paint on it or cover it in, um, in mylar and you have the perfect bucket to go and make a hydroponic setup or an aquaponic setup. Yeah. I used, cost. I used a bunch of those buckets as you planters. Know. Yeah, I just, you know, I just took a power, power yeah. just took a power drill and drilled five or six holes in the bottom for drainage, hmm. and just filled them with soil hmm. and put plants in them, and they work. Yeah, and okay. literally, they and work okay for anything that's small. Industrial, yeah, and literally any industrial kitchen, in, like you know, commercial size kitchen, will be throwing these things away in the bin. Hmm. You know, like, well, I'm you know, sort of toying a, with the it's idea. A, it's astounding how much stuff goes in the bin. Yeah, I'm sort that of, you can use. I'm sort of toying with the idea of putting the buckets in the earth, cutting out the bottom. But using them for, you know, when you pile more more soil on top of potatoes. Yeah. So yeah. cut the bottom, bottoms potatoes, out of the bucket. Yeah. Wait till the potatoes get, say, six inches above the top of the bucket that's resting on the ground, but it's got the bottom um, 
basically yep, sort out the, the jigsaw, put the bucket on top and fill it with thing. So you'll give it that yeah. plant gets like a shitload of support as well as grows taller and stronger. Yeah. I don't know whether that will work, but that will probably mean the potatoes are nearer the surface. So I won't have to dig down two mm. feet to get to the spuds. But yeah, <laughs> make stuff. It's, it's rewarding, yeah. you know. And the next yeah. bit of Mars is adapt. And it's like, that's a, that's a different way. It's just like, it's kind of like making, but you've got most of it there already. And just look at it and go, can I turn this into this? Um, I think the newest yeah. example, what? the newest example I've got of that is taking those um, angle poise mic stands and trying to fit a camera to them mm. for, for filming stuff. So I can have like a couple of cameras all set up that I can actually sort of see and make sure that they're in focus and the lighting's right and things like that and see if yeah. I can get some articulated cameras. Yeah. Well, and the other one that's struck me about what you were doing last week was um, was talking about your, where you set up your monitor type thing and adapting a monitor to be a like a, a, live, percent, a live stream that you could watch four screens in one, make sure they're all in focus and you could switch back with the forwards in it. You know, yeah. there's adapting technology. You know, disuse technology is the bane of existence of, of, of the modern waste cycle because there's literally nothing you do with it apart from post it to a third world country and, and pay someone not enough money to kill themselves recycling it. Is yeah. it's what we do. That's what modern capitalism does with, with all the e-waste in the world. I mean, when, some, some of those you, monitors you, were designed to be you know, sort of like an everything screen. So you could yeah. plug in several different things to it and just cycle between the, the mm. various things and stuff. And they can't get rid of them. I mean, yeah. you can't get rid of a CRT screen anymore, but I, I, you don't see those all that often. Mm. But they're they're sitting in landfill or sitting in e-waste dumps now. But the LCD yeah. screens, I mean, you can pick up an LCD monitor for like a fiver. There are people that will be happy to give you a, a, an you LCD want, yeah. monitor that they don't have, you know. So you can adapt that to, yeah. you know, a second screen for you. You know, you can just go, right, this was designed to be the screen for a computer, but I, it could also mm. be the second screen for a laptop or the second yeah. screen for a computer. And if you're doing video editing, yeah. you don't need a huge second screen. You could just have a 15 inch or a 19 inch monitor so you could actually play the video the, or editing. You could actually have the preview screen on its own separate screen. Yeah. That's that's adapting. Because it makes it more easy. You know, it yeah. doesn't sound like much of an ad adaptation, but it's a way of thinking about it. The adaptation doesn't need to be huge. Yeah, you know, I mean, small steps. Yeah. You just, you, you know, so adapt stuff, you know, what, what do you need? You know, is there a cheap way of doing it? What does your idea require? Yeah. You know, break it down into the, you know, literally write down the simplest requirements, write a spec sheet, and then look at the things that you can have or that you know, you're you sure that you can get cheaply and see if those things can be adapted into it. I mean, if you buy camera accessories, they're absolute, they cost an absolute fortune usually, but there are plenty of like bolts like if you need like a double end, double ended, um, was it something like four one quarter inch or twenty mil, something like that? There's a quarter inch, you know, type of screw thread that fits into the base mm. of the camera for tripods, and you can use yeah, I don't know what it is. Though what you can use bolts that are sized that 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 high, take a hacksaw and saw off the edge, the top of the bolt, and you can use that as a camera mm. extender. You're then adapting something that's in a hardware store that's like 50 for a quid and you're not being charged a tenner for an adapter you mm. know or you could route through and see if you've got any of those bolts down and use them for camera for places to pin cameras so you don't necessarily you know like you could adapt something so oh i haven't got a tripod but i have got this table and i need to mount the camera securely you know what if i um I just too. You know, if this table is mine and I don't mind it so much, I could drill a hole through this sort of side table because it's the right height and then put one of these bolts in and essentially make a camera table. So I could put a light, an angle pause light behind the camera on the camera table, you know, bolt the camera to the table or use a vice that's holding one of these, like a file down, you know, four, 420 quarter inch bolt that's the right threads thing and put that you know in in the, the little the little clamp that i've got and then i've got i don't need to buy the tripod because i'm only going to be filming from here mm. shit like that adapt stuff that's around you 
yeah. or what you need to use it for. Yeah. <coughs> um, repair should be pretty obvious. It should be. You know, fix stuff. You know, have have things like a needle and thread. Have glue. Yeah. You know, look at it and go, does does that really need repairing or can I, you know... I mean, one of my favourite repairs, I mean, it does involve a part, but the the one place where headphones tend to die for me is at the point of where the jack connector is. They always hmm. die at the point where it plugs into the thing that you're listening to, and that's so annoying, because usually the headphones are fine. It's just they use such tiny wires, I mean, built in obsolescence a bit there, but and, and that point where it, where the wires from the headphones connect to the jack plug that goes into the thing is so brittle and weak that no matter how careful you are, after about six months, headphones tend to break. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with any other part of the headphones. Just that connector. And they do sell these little screw terminal connectors where you don't have to solder, which is brilliant. So you, you literally burn the lacquer off each of the wires and they'll be marked clearly, sort of positive, negative, um, negative and left and right. When you just push the wires into the screw terminals, tighten them up with a screwdriver, and then the headphones work again. Yeah. And, exactly. and, you, and you've and you've taken a value point and turned it into a turned it into a non value point yeah, quite they're, happily. They're about with very little money. The connectors are about thirty p each, which compared yeah. to the cost of a new pair of headphones, which is headphones, yeah. And it's just it's one of those things I used to find really annoying. Yeah, I could get out my soldering iron, another repair tool, and just fix it. I just put a blob of solder on each of the connectors, but that mean I'd still have to buy a plug. Whereas this mm. is this is less of a faff. And once you've got your little wires in the right place, generally speaking, the ones with lacquer on are the left and right channels, and the copper one is that still has a clear lacquer on it. Is the ground? You put them into the relevant things, and then you take a glue gun, another repair tool, par excellence. And just put a blob of hot glue around it to which act, which dries into a kind of plastic that will relieve the stress on the wires. And I'd have mm. to say that when you put one of those connectors on, the the headphones are actually tougher than when you got them. Yeah, and and, and they're built better. You know, yeah. if you were going to design a pair of headphones, that would be the headphoniness. You would, you know, that would be the the essence of headphoniness, wouldn't it? Well, my, a cable that when it broke, you could replace easily. I think for two quid, I bought a pair of engineer headphones from the nineteen seventies. I mean, yeah. they're so old that the cover for the connector is Bakelite. And this this thing hmm. is meant to be taken apart and fixed. Yeah. You know, back in the day because, when TV because, studios had their own engineering exactly. department, yeah. and you can unscrew the cover on the Phono connector. It's big, thick, chunky wires that are easy to resolder, so you could replace the whole wire if you wanted to. You know, all the all the solder connectors uh, connections are designed to be unsoldered and fixed, and they're just brilliant. You know, yeah. So repair stuff and salvage, um, like the buckets we were talking about earlier. Snag that stuff. You know, you know. Yeah. If, if you can you know. think of a use of it, I mean, don't fill your house with junk. That's that's the side effect of of looking at this stuff and going, ah. Uh, you know, I could use that at some point down the road. You know, try and be in in, a, in the sort of the sort of frame of mind where you can think of yes, I'll do something, and make sure that you're going to use that resource within say a week. If you're gonna, if you're gonna sort of pick it up, I mean, my main desk in the studio is salvage. Hmm. You know, it was just literally in a skip. As was mine. It was just like no. Nope. Mine came, mine came free. It's only my chair. Yeah. From someone throwing out stuff out of their shed. You know, the couches yeah. beside me came from someone cleaning out their cleaning out their house. Now there so is I've a mine. It's worth checking out. You with with office chairs. It's worth if you're going to spend many many hours in it. It's worth checking out. It's it's worth looking that gift horse in the mouth and saying, let me just sit in it. Yes. And if it's got too much wobble, don't take it. Especially if it's an office chair, because they're almost impossible to fix. Yes. Office they are, chairs they are, delicate creatures. are amazingly hard to fix. You know, they're designed that way. They're designed I, I once once they've been used for a certain number of years, the only thing you can really do with them. I may be wrong. There may be somewhere out, someone out there going, I know how to fix office chairs. In which case, we want the We'd video. Like We'd like the video of how to do that, please. Because <laughs> We'd like are, to talk to you now. There are millions of office chairs uh, in the world that are just lying around. There's about, mm. We've got a dumping area for stuff that's too big for the bins where I work. 
and I'm always rooting through that to see if I can find stuff to swipe. You know, if it, if it'll fit in a rucksack or I can carry it and it's usable, I tend to tend to wander yeah. off with it. And you should, you should salvage that stuff. Oh, look, it stopped. And welcome back to part two. I've reset the background. That was good, though, because we got to the end of Mars. Make, adapt, repair, salvage. Yeah. And we've given good... We, 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 it, it limited us to spending half an hour doing it. So, yay us. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is a two-part show as well. The next one is Venus, which is a bit harder to define, really. Yeah, I suppose it is, it's, yeah, it is harder to define. Um, it's, it, does, it, is, it is much, much more, much more of a concept rather well, than. Uh, I, w I was going for, for for your balance in it. I was I was going for yeah. for um, the whole balance of the thing, in that you know you've got Mars and Venus, and traditionally those are sort of men and women, and I I don't want to discourage um, people of different genders other than cis male from being part of the church server. And if anybody can yes. think of an uh, of, a, of an androgynous term for monk, um, then that would be good because I've been racking my brains. I yeah. know oh, I can't think of one either. I must admit it's been it's been doing my head in. Because I like monk. It Cause... implies a certain amount of self reflection, and there's an image you yeah. have of a monk, whether it's a Buddhist monk or a, a you know a Capuchin yeah. monk or a, a Gregorian monk. There is this kind of a sense of peace about people like that, in the way that none doesn't. I mean. I suppose if you're going to be completely comfortable with yourself, introducing yourself as a nun of server, you know, would be quite funny. It would mean that you were comfortable yeah. with who you are. No, yeah. but then you'd, you'd have to be, and then you could launch into sort of a, a of a into a medley from Sound of Music <laughs> to everybody's utter Someone horror. Up. You can imagine the horror you'd get yeah. when you start that. You're calling yourself a nun, but you're a bloke. Allow me to explain through music. <laughs> the hills are alive. Sorry, that would just be really. Funny enough, someone was actually singing that this morning while I was waiting for work to start this morning. <laughs> I was someone singing that in the park next to work, and I was like, I knew we actually broke into song to sing with them, because um, yeah. one of it's one of those things having a having a small daughter has taught me to really really enjoy the sound of music. Yeah. You sort of really get the whole like you have to listen to this thing so often, and it is it, you know. Oh, your your audio not, is going not, to pop. It's nice when it's nice when they fight the Nazis. But they don't Why fight the Nazis. Why is going to pop? That's because no, they just run away from the Nazis. But it's nice that it's nice that the Nazis appeared and then they went like, "Ha ha, Nazis are dumb," and they went away. Anyway, enough enough discord on the uh, on the Nazis. They're horrible. We won't play with. Them. Yeah. Say something again, because I think the audio really tripped out. Oh, I don't want it to. Why does it have to trip out? Oh, that's Why, better. I yeah, it was coming. momentarily. I bet you someone, and someone's trying to annoy them, annoy me by using the internet at my house. Yeah, probably. I should ban them. Yeah. So go on then. Venus, very easy, natural user sustainability. Yeah. Or Which I love the idea. Or of. I think I think I put it down as natural use sustainability. Ah, uh, you did. Yes. Um, so what I wanted to do with that. And it was really hard to get an acronym together for Venus, by the way. If anybody's got a better one, now's the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, the idea of, on a very personal level, you try and sort out some kind of like energy and food sustainability for yourself. And it doesn't matter to what level you do that. You know, I mean, if you if you got like a solar panel sorted out that was charging batteries, or you've got like a tiny wind turbine in your garden, just from an experimental point of view, if you know, it's just that it's just that getting those skills together, getting the um, like growing your own food, that's a skill worth mm. that's so worth having. You know, even if yeah. all you've done is grow a row of potatoes or grow some herbs on on your windowsill. Um, to that end, um, to the growing things end. Um, Uncle Doris, who's who's the main lead on the Uncle Doris show, Death becomes yes. Death becomes us, is is going to basically give me. Uh, a, we're going to over a year. We're going to do regular tours of his massive allotment. And if you're not from mm. the UK, there is this weird thing um, in the UK because 
for, for a bunch of reasons. We have these things called allotments where you can apply to join a local allotment association and you pay a tiny amount of rent. I can't remember how much it is. I think uh, my, my, I've, I actually still have my allotments in England, yeah. funnily enough. How much is that a and year? We, my, mine, are, mine were, I think they were £5 a year and I paid for something like, I can't remember how many years I paid for, but I paid for a lot of years. It was like, I, I'm going to see out that number of years and I'll pay for that number of years. And the allotment society were very excited because I prepaid my allotment for that many years and they went good. And I just covered mine in berries. Yeah. And, and my mum is still going and accesses it and, and, you know, picks all my berries and does and puts potatoes in and does stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it, that's Harlequin's allotment though. It's yeah. not anyone else's. They, they, Other people are allowed to come and visit. They can have food, but it's my, specifically that's mine. Get off my you land. Know. Yeah, get off my land. It's my land. It's my tractor. Uh, but yeah, that's, See, that's it, the thing. In the and UK, that, you can get these things called allotments. And the reason we have them is because of the Enclosures Act. Yeah. Um, because poor people, like the, like... poor people were threatening to starve to death if they didn't have land they could grow vegetables and keep chickens on Yeah, and there's all sorts of weird things it's a really weird undercurrent of society is, a, is an allotment association um, and essentially I, I, it, I would describe it as one of the most beautiful things in the world it is, it's I, a I, great I, idea I, I've, tried to, I've tried to start one here in Australia and I've uh, <clears throat> and I've fought and fought and fought to try and get an allotment society started and people don't understand it. They just have no time for it. They can't think. And you go to council and they go, that's a lovely idea, but no one will use it. And you're like, if you do this, people will come and you'll be surprised at how many people use it. Yeah. Um, don't... I mean, it's, it's somewhat fallen out of favour. And it used to be the most working class thing ever to have an allotment. And now it's become quite a middle now class quite... thing. Yeah, it's quite posh now. Yeah. Um, apart from mine. So I, I think I probably need to see it. There's got to be an allotment society near me. I can't imagine, because this is a purpose-built council estate. There's, there will be allotments. So I shall, I shall have a look. But um, Uncle Doris has got a massive allotment. Because you, you get one per person, essentially. So if there's two of you living in a household, you can both apply to have an allotment. Mm. And uh, yeah, so you you get, I don't know, it's usually about... 10 metres by 20 metres of, you know, that sort yeah, of size. Chain length. It's just a chain, chain length squared. Yeah. It's exactly how much, it's exactly, they, someone worked out a long time ago, it's exactly how much land you need in the UK to um, to put enough vegetables aside for one family's worth of, uh, one family's worth of yeah. food. It's like the ancient Japanese um, monetary measurement of a koku. It's sort of like um, um, the amount of rice one family of four needs to live for a year. And and the allotment is kind of enough space to grow enough vegetables to keep you in vegetables for a year. Yeah. And some of them allow you to keep chickens and some of them have communal chicken sheds. So you mm. could you can purchase some chickens. So you get four chickens or six chickens, you know, and they live in, in the communal chicken house because it's quite hard yeah. to protect chickens from foxes if you're not there all the time. Yes. So, yeah, you know, so, you know, the idea of having an allotment or putting over some of your garden to grow in vegetables, just so you know how to grow vegetables. But also, mm. you get the vegetables. You know, I mean, it's quite yeah, hard to actually get, save yeah. a significant amount of money unless you're very careful. If you grow just like, say, two rows of potato plants, a row of garlic, a row of onions, and a row of carrots. Yeah. Um, but there's all sorts of... I think we'll probably be going into vegetable growing quite hard um, with with this series. And hopefully I'm yeah, going certainly. to try gardening again this year in the garden. But I made several major mistakes with last year's garden. You can you learn from those? Yeah. but I mean, Practice it, makes perfect. Mostly I planted too much stuff and didn't give the stuff to enough space. And I planted the stuff too late. Those were my yeah. key mistakes. I tried to get too much into yeah. one tiny greenhouse. And it, essentially the lack of space killed a lot of the plants. Mm. But out of the 60 quid I spent, I've still got, at least 45 quids worth of stuff yeah so it wasn't a write-off and, and you certainly learned a lot and, and, I, and, and you will do better next time and, and and you know the world will keep going around and you will keep growing things yeah you know and this yeah. year i'm going to take the, the, the radical negative. step of reading the how to grow vegetables book 
that's probably a good start. <laughs> well, I thought, I would, you know, I would, advise anyone, I would advise anyone who would like to go and grow some vegetables to go and find that, go and find a decent book on organic gardening and go and read it. Yeah. Because even if you don't believe in organic gardening, the organic gardening book will probably explain it a lot, a lot simpler than any other book. And do you know where you can get uh, a good, gar- a good, a good sort of vegetable gardening book? Go on then. Any charity shop. Any yeah, charity true. shop. Any any charity shop will have in it a very very good uh, organic gardening book because that's where all mine come from. I've literally got every nearly every single gardening. I think I bought one organic guy. Um, which is the, I think the only one I would say that I bought would be the RHS was Organic Gut, uh, which was produced by Dawling Kingsley because it was a Dawling Kingsley book and they make very, very good reference books and it was a very good reference book it still is yeah and do you know why you can always um, find them at charity shops because mad people unlike me throw them out no the reason you can find them at charity shops is, is why the reason you can always find certain types of technology at a charity shop is because it's generally mm. clearance from old people's home houses that have died. Yes, and true. And old, old people spend a lot of time gardening. Yeah. You know, so it's basically, if, if you're interested, you know, I, in about 15 years, you'll be able to buy good records in charity shops. Because, you know, people that actually had a decent taste in music will be dead. And yes. their record collections and their book collections will suddenly flow into charity shops. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's all technology from the 70s, so like hair curlers and yogurt makers and stuff. And there is a bit of me that says I should make yogurt. Because I eat a shed ton of yogurt, but it, I just can't be bothered. I've got to get around that. But yeah. I, I eat a shed ton of coconut yogurt. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's it's just, it's just the faff of making it. I've made ginger beer. I was very pleased with myself. The problem with ginger beer is you, once you start making ginger beer, you I've can't stop. No, ginger beer plants require constant feeding and love. Yeah. They're like they're a living organism. If anyone doesn't know, yeah, if you ever want to do something really cool and grow a ginger beer plant, because it's actually quite fascinating how a ginger beer plant, it's a self-contained unit. It's a, it's a, it's a fungi and a bacteria all growing on one another yeah, and, just... and doing amazing things. Yeast, sugar, and ginger. Yeah, and, and it just makes a, 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 it makes a floaty yeast plant, basically, and it makes cool stuff happen. But they're very fascinating to watch and grow and learn about. They are, and you can flavour um, the ginger beer. Yeah. Because ginger beer, ginger beer on its own can be a hassle. Um, and uh, so what I did was I'd, added, I, I'd make it into a cordial. Because you get, you, mm. basically, when you produce it, you sort of drain off half the liquid. And then you, with, with with the sediment that you get back, you just add some more liquid and some more sugar to feed the the yeast and stuff. And then you keep it; it carries on going. And then when you bottle the ginger beer, you have to sort of like let off some of the gas every so often. Um, otherwise, it explodes. But you're supposed to drink it fairly quickly. But it's naturally fizzy. That's the weird thing about it. It's like slightly sparkling ginger drink. So I always used to add other flavors mm. to it because I got very bored of the ginger beer very quickly. And that's why in certain countries, um, ginger beer is hugely popular because anybody can make yeah. it. You can make it yeah, anywhere. Because it's literally like, it's a refreshing drink that's, that's usable, that's made literally from sugar and sugar is very cheap yeah. worldwide. And um, and it has no other input particularly. And it's fizzy, so it's kind of like, it's, and it if breaks up the taste yeah, flavors. If you've got a ginger beer plant, you can halve it and give half the ginger beer plant to someone else. Yeah, and you can affect their life with a horrible virus that will take over their world and yeah. fill little bottles and jars on the shelf. You just yeah, cannot drink right. it fast enough. If you're just one per, because I, I made it a few years ago, and if there was one thing I learned, it's like you've got to be able to distribute this out to other people, or you've got to be prepared yeah. to drink a shitload of ginger beer. No. So back to our back to our gardening. Go on then. Well, so I think we like you had you defined a few bits and pieces that like you said potatoes were a really good thing to grow and onions and carrots because they both grow together really well and also herbs. Well, they grow um, some, onions and, and carrots it, grow together really well because the onions and carrots, um, they basically disperse uh, the pests that affect the other plant. Yeah, they're you a get, companion plant. Yeah, word, you, can get, you can get onion fly and white fly. You know, white fly affects yeah. carrots and onion fly affects onions, obviously. But if you plant them next to each other. The smell of the onions will get rid of the carrot fly, and the, something about the carrots um, 
biological output. Stop. Yeah. yeah, just just stop all that. And potatoes and, are good because you can do everything with them. Yeah, like so when I was when I did my when I did my studies in organic farming, um, one of the things I did a lot of writing about was um, the idea of a sustainable garden. And idea of a sustainable garden because I was organic farming. I did specifically, but one of the things we talked about was like what is a disaster garden what can you grow that will basically feed you um what can you always make grow and what's the easiest thing in the world to grow and we came up with sort of half a dozen things you could easily grow in australia and right now and it was basically anyone could grow tomatoes reasonably easily in australia cherry tomatoes potatoes onions um most people could have a chicken or um, bits and pieces that you could also grow but lots of herbs and species and if you have those things then you'll never starve that's the that's the that's the that was the crux of the argument going forward was if you if you just grow potato you have it you have the sustained existence in the world because diets will because a potato will feed you without any other input you might well lose weight but you will survive if you just eat potatoes and what you cook them scurvy? in a different way no vitamin A and vitamin C are both present in high quantities in in potatoes and you won't die wow. So you can just grow potatoes. So if you're interested, if you're interested, there was a guy who did a YouTube channel thing. He talks about this thing called potato diet and a bar diet. There's a link. There'll be a link in the show notes talking about it for men's health, which is a which is a very two sided discussion of the whole thing, talking about whether it's good or bad and why it's good and bad. Um, but basically, you can survive just by eating potatoes. Um, there's also a very famous, well, I think it's a famous line um, uh, from the 1980s, I want to say, which was written by the man who supposedly walked across Iraq. What's his name? The guy who wrote Bravo 2-0. I'm sure it's Bravo 2-0. Oh, Andy McNabb. Yep. So in the, in the book that comes before Bravo 2-0, it's called Immediate Action. Yeah. And he talks about in, in Immediate Action, he talks about um, going to the pub and having a Guinness and having and walking home and having a serve of chips. And, um, an and the idea cocktail. was is basic, because basic because basically you could you could survive on a, on a serve of chips on a serve of hot chips and a Guinness. Wow! Excuse my dingle. Was I throw something at my dog? Okay. And make well, her wake up. Well, that's an interesting, definitely worth knowing thing. <coughs> yeah. I um, mean, and also I, the weird thing about potatoes. In in in, a, in the way of a lot of plants are. I mean, I know that's the point of a potato, but if you keep back one potato out of every plant, yeah, and you you've put got it, enough you, to grow the next year's potatoes. You put it, you put it in, say, you know, just put a, put say two dozen of them into a bucket, just the smallest potatoes that you're not going to eat, and you put them in the dark. They'll start putting out hmm. eyes and shoots and stuff like that. So you've got your sea potatoes yeah. for next year. Yeah, and it doesn't I mean, matter. I, I, it doesn't matter how I, fucked up you can tell where potato I've grown potatoes. Yeah. You, you, know. can, you can always tell where I have grown a potato because I will dig over the potatoes and I'll always chuck a few back wherever I put them mm. and just leave them there. And then the next year you'll get a potato plant come up. And a potato plant is very distinctive looking when it grows and look, when it comes out of the ground. It's very distinctive looking. Yeah, they're very plant. bushy. They're very, they're very bushy and they're quite, you know, they're actually quite pretty things. I did get some potatoes um, so the other thing out, I wanted... out of my potato buckets, but you can't really grow them in buckets. Just yeah, not... you've got to have a slightly bigger square. And those yeah. um, big potato cubes don't really work mm. i mean you really just no. got to bite the bullet and go no the potato needs to be a whole bunch of separate plants you do need to skep them when when they get to a certain size otherwise they'll stay at a smaller size you know you need yeah. to cut you need to cover most of the the potato plant you need to bank it up with earth when mm. when you do that because they need to think yeah. oh shit i'm still underground and then you get bigger potatoes but yeah. there's nothing wrong with the smaller potatoes you can still use those but yeah, if you, if you just, you know, out of every potato plant, when you're digging them up, you just bang them straight back in the ground in September. Yeah. And you, just, you just leave them there. Whether you want it, you know, and generally speaking, you can't get all the potatoes up no matter how well you dig them up anyway. So there'll always be five or six potato plants popping up next year in your potato patch anyway. Yeah. But, you know, if you if you consciously make the effort, say say you've got 30 potato plants, and you put 30, you just leave 30 small potatoes in the ground for next year, break up some of the topsoil at the beginning of the year, you pretty much your potato patch will carry on. Yeah. Which is why it's and, so and, popular and, yeah. with poor people wherever the potatoes are grown. Yeah. Because A, like you just mentioned, you can pretty much live on them. And B, 
the cultivation is pretty easy. The potato kind of does it all itself. Yeah, it's not it's not hard work. You know, the hard the hard work is the first one. Um, if people want a really good, um, if people want to start off and they want a really good intro, there's a guy called Peter Cundall. It's C U N D uh, Cundall. C U N D I N Cundall. No, I think that's right. Anyway, search for Peter Cundall. He does a, a, a video on a show called Gardening Australia in the 1990s. He did an episode about starting off an organic garden. It's very, very interesting. There's a little clip in there about doing a no-dig potato patch. Um, I will hopefully be able to demonstrate this year going into what is now my autumn. Um, and I can now grow things again because it's not 45 degrees and 47 degrees on a daily basis. And there's actually some water in the creek. Um, so I'm going to try and put in a potato bed as an example. And all it is is just getting sheet newspaper that's recycled. So going to the local news agent, go and getting all the recycled newspapers, going and get all the recycled cardboard you can get from an office somewhere or other, just getting it wet, laying it on top of the grass, and then covering that all in straw with some um, with some um, fertilizer underneath and something to some bit of clay break, a bit of gypsum to break up the clay if you've got any clay in your soil. Or coffee grounds. And literally just more coffee grounds and just burying in your um, and putting your potatoes in there and your potatoes will just grow and you just keep heaping stuff on top of stuff on top of stuff on you know piles and piles and piles on top and you'll get the most beautiful potatoes and underneath will be the most fertile soil they have ever had yeah um it's a beautiful way of making a garden bed um i'm very conscious of time and i wanted to mention also um so there's another method that i think is a really really good method of people starting out um, it's called the Three Sisters. It's an ancient, um, it's sort of ancient uh, Indigenous American process of growing things um, in sort of the southern states of America. And it, it's basically you growing um, a squash or a pumpkin, beans and corn all together in a, in a symbiotic relationship. Um, and I think it's really, really well demonstrated. It, it talks about it in a sort of allegorical way in Anathem by Stevenson. Um, there's lots of really good information about about on the web as well, but it's a really fascinating way of growing things because your your corn grows up and it and it's taking nitrogen out of the soil, but it's very very tall. And then your beans grow and beans fix nitrogen in the soil, so they're a nitrogen fixing agent. They have nodules on them that fix nitrogen, and they grow up the corn. The and they grow up the corn, and then to cover the ground underneath, so you're not constantly having to weed the goddamn corn patch because that the most annoying thing for a corn plant is to have other things around it that are sort of like grasses that are getting in the way of it and binding it up mm. and also beans so you're growing squash underneath those and a squash like a butternut squash or like a gourd squash would, um, would, i wonder if pumpkin would do the same thing i think it does i've, I've grown pumpkins over because a pumpkin and a squash to me are the same thing yeah. i'm sure they're probably not but in australia they're called the same thing so i've always gr- i've always grown a purple skinned pumpkin in australia yeah. um which is a very old variety of pumpkin in australia um, because it's the one that we can get seeds for and they last really, really well. They'll last a good 12 months because they've got a real hard skin on them. Um, and they're a really nice pumpkin to make a soup out of. Okay, um, so, so yeah, I mean, with the... And, that, and it, it's, a really, it's a really novel way of growing and it doesn't take up a lot of room and it's a really, really, like, you know, I, I think there's nothing better than going outside and playing with the kids and getting them to start doing stuff because I think they're, they're very fascinated by the process of, you know, like you can buy them some corn, you know, and, and say you're going to put this in the ground and grow it in a grow it on the warm shelf in the kitchen type thing, and then, and then take it outside when it gets to be two inches thing, and they'll they'll stand there and be fascinated by the process you've just gone through. Yeah, you know, and then you get to eat it at the end. You know, and there's nothing greater. You know, there's whole movements in schools now that say this is what you should do with children. This is how they learn. This is what they do. Da da da. You know, where my daughter goes to school now, hmm. she spends every every Thursday morning they spend out in the garden they do all the gardening around the school all themselves with a couple of other helpers but you know basically on their own they do all the hard work and then they take all the produce they make in the, in the garden and they take it inside and on a Friday morning they cook that produce and they make their own lunches mm. you know and, and that's you know that's the reason why she goes to school is because that's part of the program that you know we wanted to see her really thrive with yeah um and it's a lot less transitory because people are there caring for it and all that type thing. And in rental, and in rental situations, if you're stuck in the world of capitalism, um, then you know it really is crap when you go every year and you go, "Well, am I putting in a garden that someone else is going to eat?" Hmm. You know, which is hard work. That's why allotments are such a good thing. Even if you live in the UK, get an allotment. If you live in Australia, you get in a community garden and get organised in the local council, do all this sort of stuff to move forward from it type thing. Or even, um, you know, I mean, if you've got, I mean, you can do something like if you've got a south-facing window. You could even just put in, you just put stuff in the window. You know, yeah, just, get just a, go and grab get, some herbs and just plant some herb seeds. And plant something, 
so that you know growing yeah. something in order to eat it and maintaining it isn't an alien skill if you ever have to do it yeah i mean that's the thing you, i can i can go to the shop now and i can go and spend uh three dollars fifty australians that's that like nearly a pound, more than a pound hmm. right on a bunch of on a bunch of herbs and that bunch of herbs will be like half of my half of the for dinner if i make you know if i make a yeah or i can go and plant the same amount of seeds and that will supply me with half a year's supply of you know coriander to go in my in go in my salad to make my yeah. salsa with I mean, so you, which you one of those cheat. is more you know you can cheat a little bit because a lot of supermarkets now sell herbs in pots yeah so Just get yourself a whopping go and get go and buy yourself three quids worth of compost Go and buy yourself yeah. a one pound pot of basil or something. Put it, get one, get, you know, salvage a bucket from somewhere, fill the bucket with compost, and put this tiny little pot plant in the big bucket of compost. Yeah. You know, make sure it's relatively well watered and drained, and that little pot of herbs will grow to like a planter full of that herb. Yeah, and it'll be quite happy just living in that bucket. You know, just give it a trim occasion. Yeah, if you're going to have house plants, you know, have really useful ones. Yeah. I mean, this year I yeah. think in the greenhouses, the only things I'm going to leave in the greenhouses because I've got two now um, is the tomatoes and mm. the chilies. Yeah, because um, obviously gonna, they both need a bit more warmth than you're going to so get there. Yeah. I think each greenhouse is probably going to have say six tomato plants mm. and then six chili plants. Yeah, you know, one chili plant in a bucket one tomato plant in a bucket you know yeah. let it trail and just see if i can get like out product so i'm looking for a sack yeah. of potatoes a sack of onions a shitload of garlic some chilies some carrots and you know tomatoes and and i'll be happy you know if it just takes that yeah. out and just does that and i'm also wondering whether you can replace kilner jars that you'd use to say um pot passata into yeah instead of using those though whether you can use those clip lock plastic jars you know the 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 really cheap ones with a clip down lock on the top yeah. i think that's going to be just as good as a kilner jar and a lot cheaper i mean if you can get kilner yeah, jars, they're much more re- they're mu- kilner jars are more reusable because they'll last they'll last forever essentially and you can boil them out so i might end up getting a few kilner jars here and there but yeah, I do want to grow stuff. So, th- so the idea of Venus is basically sustainable technology like food and el- energy that you can do in a in on a small scale, so that if you ever needed to, you could scale that up. Yeah. So one of the other things I want to get this year is a solar panel, and actually use mm. it for all my charging stuff. Just one eighty watt yeah, solar so you're, panel you're, in the right place in the yeah, garden. Yeah, you're charging, you're charging off, off that thing, and it's yeah. it's making it. Um, that's making that carbon neutral stuff. Or as carbon neutral as you yeah. can make something. Get one you know, ten. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, high yeah. high technology is getting cheaper. Yeah, and just so that there is a solar power station that I can, hmm. I don't know, at some point maybe run my laptop from. Yeah. You know, have a have a have yeah. a convert like a, a what do you call it? Uh, what do you call those this things? This is a car converter. Yeah. Um, Transformer. No, it's a... It's got... It's another word that actually gives you a three-pin three plug connected to 12 volts. An inverter. Sign inverter. Yeah. Get a, not, I, about that. I don't need it to be super... You know, just get a an inverter connected to a 12-volt mm. battery that's connected via a, a charge controller to a solar panel. Hmm. And then go right, okay. So, get that. So I'm I'm running my laptop off solar, say, nearly mm. all the time. Or I can just go right, okay, fair enough. I can't plug in a washing machine, but I can plug in all this other stuff. Yeah. So it's a usable chunk of electricity. So it is a power station. And then add maybe a couple more solar panels at a later date to it. Just just so that if I do ever want to go off grid, I've acquired another skill, and that would be part of the Venus plan. <clears throat> so I think that's it. That's Mars and Venus sort of explained. And yeah, it, and it, I think we're very close to an hour. Oh, brilliant! Um, yeah, so it's just, it just, I wanted some balance into it, you know. Yeah. And 
I wanted, I didn't want to sort of lean heavily on the whole gender thing. It's just it was easier to come up with an acronym for Mars than it was for Venus. Hmm. So there you go. Think of one for Venus. We'll, we'll ask for that. More important on the Venus one. If there's something closer to the mark, then we want it. Yeah. If there's if if you can come up with something like that, but that'd be great. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it, and we're at our hour mark, pretty much.